guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you all are doing well and healthy. Happy Friday. For those who do not know, my name is Caitlin Elliott and I cover true crime cases on Tuesdays and Fridays with my more vintage cases being covered on Fridays. In my last video, I had recently covered the case of Stephanie Ann Crow and I talked about that horrible injustice that had been done to her family. Today, I wanted to cover a case that had been recently solved on the 15th of March, 2022. This is the now solved case of Little Miss Nobody. In the year of 1960, there was so much going on in the world. The nifty 50s, as they were called back then, was coming to a close. And so was that post-war baby boom that had been caused after World War II. During this time, there was the first ever televised presidential debate. And this was between John F. Kennedy and Richard Tricky Dick Nixon. On July 31st of 1960, there was a teacher who was from Las Vegas, Nevada. He was traveling through New Mexico. The, while he was traveling, he decided to stop right off of Route 93 at the Sand Creek Bed to search for some stones in Congress, Arizona. Congress, Arizona is a small town in Yavapai County, Arizona. The teacher was going to find some stones by the river to help uh, decorate his garden with, and he was very proud of this garden. While searching for the stones, the man became horrified when he ended up stumbling upon the body of a young child. The innocent little girl had been buried, sitting up with her arms outstretched to the sky. The little girl had only been dead for about two weeks prior to her discovery, with the cause of death listed as unknown due to how decomposed her body was. If any of you guys out there watching are from Arizona, have ever traveled to Arizona, you would know that it is a very desert type of climate and it is very hot there. So this causes bodies to decompose a lot more quickly than if you were in a much colder climate. Due to the heat, like I said, due to the heat and then being close to the Mexican border, this would cause the heat from Mexico to rise up towards Arizona and would cause the decomposition to be faster. The little girl's death was ultimately ruled a homicide. What was really bizarre about her was that her hair had recently been dyed auburn and that her nails were painted bright red. Along with a pair of adult-sized sandals that had actually been cut down to fit her feet. The child had also been wearing white or light pink shorts with a checkered top. When the original autopsy had been done on this little girl's body, reports claimed that she had been had to be between the ages of five to seven years old. And however, these claims ultimately ended up being dropped down to between the ages of three and six years old due to the fact that Little Miss had all of her baby teeth still intact. I feel like, and this is just my honest opinion, when they said that she was now between the ages of three and six and she still had all of her baby teeth still intact, that they feel like that just made it even more sad. The local Yavapai County Police Department decided to collectively figure out who this little girl could be. Local news media and citizens tried their best to help solve this case and give the little girl her name back. The case ended up being broadcasted to the local news stations and radios to help bring awareness to the case. The local Yavapai County and Sheriff Deputy traveled hundreds of miles to... Um, figure out exactly where the little girl could have come from. Hundreds of calls and letters were sent into the police station, but none of these leads went anywhere. So in August of 1960, police began to theorize that this little girl could be Sharon Lee Gallegos, who was a little girl who went missing that same year. But police then theorized that this could not have been Sharon Lee Gallegos because the Jane Doe seemed a lot older than her. Then the police thought that she could be a child that had belonged to a migrant family. A migrant is defined as a person who moves from place to place in search of a better life and better work. A good example of this would be a Mexican family who traveled to the United States to get jobs to take care of their family. The Jane Doe had come from a Hispanic or Caucasian background, so it's quite possible that this child could have been from a migrant background or could have came here illegally and they didn't want to... Uh, say that they had been illegal, so they didn't want to come forward and say that their child was theirs. Then, the police then said that it was a possibility that this could have been a child belonging to the man, the name of, belonging to a man named Lester Davidson, 
who along with his children had been hitchhiking through Yavapai County and he was from New Mexico and this had all occurred in July of 1960. So the family ended up having no connection to the Jane Doe case nor the disappearance of little Sharon Gallejos. The police then found a bloody knife that, that was by the little girl's body, but it was super bizarre because the little girl had actually not been stabbed. So why was there a bloody knife nearby her body? It was then stated that the, by the police that this knife was actually in, not in connection to the death of Little Miss Nobody. So the detectives then sent the knife and the clothes that the little girl had been wearing to the DNA analysis lab. On August 10th of 1960, the little girl was laid to rest at Mountain View Cemetery, where 70 people had actually gone to her funeral. The case ended up going cold once again, and there were no leads until seven months later when the police got another possible identity. This time, it was said that the young girl could possibly be a, little, a missing child named Deborah Jane Dudley, or Debbie Dudley, as she was commonly known by, by her family. She was a four-year-old little girl who, along with four of her other siblings, had gone missing after their seven-year-old sister named Carol Ann was found deceased. However, this proved to be a false lead when it was announced that Debbie's remains were later found in Virginia, and she, along with her four other remaining siblings, had died due to malnutrition. Their parents ended up being charged with the murders of five of their ten children. So on August 8th of 1961, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Department led police officers to where her body had been located and claimed while holding a sandal that someone somewhere knows what happened and knows the answer of who this little girl is. This clip was later broadcasted onto news channels and radio stations, but nothing ever came from this. In 2018, her remains were dug up again to run a DNA sample to help uh, figure out who this little girl could be. And this was done through a genetic geneal genealogy website that had been used to actually catch the Golden State Killer. And a brand new reconstruction paper was uploaded to the NamUs website, which stands for the National... Um, and missing and exploited children website. So because of this new reconstruction photo, police reopened her case back up again and put her DNA back into NamUs. Like I said, it stands for the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, and this is exact system had been used to solve multiple cold cases, even cases people believed would never be solved. Police and detectives believe that with this new technology, it could be used to help solve this case. Detectives put the DNA from the crime scene into the database with hopes that there would be a match. But unfortunately, nothing ever came from this. And what's super bizarre is that the little girl, like I said, had her hair dyed auburn. And this was extremely uncommon because a lot of people back in the 60s, back in the 50s, didn't really dye their hair. And especially not the hair that belonged to children. You never really dye children's hair because it is just so fine and porous, especially if, you know, this little girl was said to be between the ages of three and six, she would still have her baby hair, which if you don't know what baby hair is, it's the soft, extra thin hair that lots of young children have. And when you dye that hair, it can make it become fine and brittle and break off. So it was just so weird to me that this little girl had her hair dyed. So in the 19, like I said, in the 1960s, they did not dye their hair. And this came along with a theory that the little girl had actually been abducted and someone had been trying to disguise her. On March 15th of 2022, just a few weeks ago, this case just just took off with a whole new light. It was announced that the little Miss Nobody Jane Doe had been truly identified. And when I found out about this, I was just jumping up and down. I was in tears. I was so excited because it just seemed like the, the time had gone by so slowly and there was no leads or anything that could lead to the identification of this girl, but you have to also remember 
that with the times there also is going to be more advanced technology. Back in the year of 1960, they didn't have any of those types of DNA analysis that we have nowadays. They didn't have computers. They didn't really have um, any type of lab work that could be done to uh, show what this uh, child's identity could be. So whenever this was announced that her identity was solved, I remember I was waiting for just days and days like, oh my gosh, are they going to announce it? Who was this little girl? Was she Debbie Dudley? Was she was she this person? Was she this person? Who could she have been? And when they announced the identity, and when I tell you guys who this little girl was, let me just tell you when I found out about it and I was doing the research, it just frustrated me to no end because this little girl's identity had been ruled out previously in 1960. And I feel like if it wouldn't have been ruled out as a possibility, you know, people would be ha like people would know who this little girl was her case would have been solved much quicker her case really would not have sat there cold for decades and decades and decades like literally it took 62 years to solve this little girl's case like it's so insane so like i said on march 15th 2022 the little girl's identity had been announced to the public and the little girl's nephew stated actually at a press conference that day that he was absolutely grateful that the case had truly been solved and he thanked the Yavapai County Sheriff's uh, Department and the Police Department for the state of Arizona to for um, putting in so much work to help solve this case and being so dedicated to finding out who this little girl's identity truly was and when you, I found out the identity of the little girl and I had been researching and everything. It just makes it even more heartbreaking when you find out truly how old this little girl was, how she died. It's just, it's so frustrating. This poor guy, like he was, I'd probably say he was about maybe in his 50s or 60s. He had said that he had never met his aunt before and he really wish that he would have had that opportunity and it just broke my heart because this little girl's life had been cut so short so i'm going to tell you guys who this little girl's identity was and i need to take a deep breath because it's wild the little girl was identified publicly as the missing child Sharon Lee Gallejos. Sharon was only four years old when she was abducted from her home in New Mexico. She lived in Alamogardo with her grandmother, her mother, her two older siblings, and four older children that were either siblings or cousins. It wasn't truly um, identified whether or not these were cousins or they were siblings. Sharon's biological father, he was a soldier in the United States Army at the time who left in the year of 1955 when Sharon was just a baby. So her mother ended up having to raise her children by herself and back then you know, it wasn't very common to be a single mother. So she ended up moving back in with her mother, the kid's grandmother, and raising her children there in Yavapai County. So... Uh, for, like I said, they had four other children, and Sh Sharon was described by her family to have been a very feisty and outspoken, spunky little girl who enjoyed playing with her siblings along with running errands with her mother. Sharon was also described as being a very friendly little girl who got along with all of the other neighborhood children. She was also stated to have a very fair complexion. She was the only person in her family who was said to have uh, been called um, a la guerra. So this, was me this meant that she was blonde haired, light skinned, and she had blue eyes. So she looked so much different than her other family. Authorities believe that the couple that had actually kidnapped Sharon had been stalking her for weeks prior to her abduction. 
So on Sunday, July 17th of 1960, that same couple that had stalked her and kidnapped her were actually seen at a local church in the area with two small children. The woman, who is either the wife or the mother, she started asking the local parishioners about Sharon Lee Gallejos. And I don't know about y'all, but whenever I read about that, she had been asking about that child. That kind of like put me on edge. It was the weirdest thing. Like, who goes around asking other people like, Hey, you know, what about that Sharon girl? Do you guys know anything about that Gallejos family? About that little girl named Sharon with the blonde hair and the blue eyes? And it's just so weird. Especially in a church, a place of worship. Like, what? It's just so weird. So, it was then stated by the neighbors that lived in Sharon's neighborhood that that same woman would knock on other people's homes, like, hello, and ask about Sharon's mother, where they lived, and whether or not she had a little girl, and even went so far as to ask about the family's financial situation. I would love to know what you guys think about that because I have so many opinions on that, that the fact that, that creepy lady went around asking. That's so weird. It kind of seems like um, Georgia Tan, and you guys know who Georgia Tan was? She was this woman back in the 1930s and 40s who would uh, portray herself as a social worker, but she would actually kidnap these children and send them off to poor families to get raised, even though they actually had, you know, a decent family life. So it's just, it's so bizarre to me. So it was, the, like I said, that woman was actually in the neighborhood, knocking on doors, asking about Sharon and the family's financial situation, which is none of her damn business. Sharon's mother later told authorities that Sharon started acting really strange prior to her abduction. She refused to go to the store with her mother and she actually panicked and started like hyperventilating and crying, having, you know, panic attacks at the sight of unus unusual cars, like cars that they had never seen. It was then stated that Sharon was very nervous and on edge anytime she was outside of the family home, which was not like Sharon. She was a very calm, loving child. Sharon even became absolutely terrified of a green colored car. Maybe it was possibly a four door sedan. And it seemed to follow her and her family around. Again, that's just the most bizarre thing to have like this car stalking you. It's so weird. Around 3 p.m. on July 21st of 1960, Sharon was actually outside of her family home that day playing with her two cousins when a couple in that exact same green car that they had been seen following Sharon around pulled up to the home. She, so they asked Sharon if she wanted to come with them to get candy, toys, and new clothes. Sharon refused and this was when the woman exited the car and latched onto Sharon's arm and dragged her into the car before taking off like a bat out of hell down 5th Street. The woman abductor was said to have been in her 30s and she was very heavy set with glasses along with short dirty blonde hair. And the man was stated as being thin, fair-skinned, and had a long nose with sandy-colored hair. The witnesses to the abduction immediately reported this to Sharon's mother, who quickly called the police. The police act as quickly as they can. They actually set roadblocks, which remember I talked about it with the Rachel Runyon case. And this was done in order to call, like have the couple's... A couple pulled over so they could investigate and actually find Sharon but this ended up being a failure. The motives behind Sharon's abduction is still undetermined though ransom was considered a possibility even though there were no demands for money sent to the family so at this it's still unknown why exactly this fa like this couple targeted this little girl why would they have done this? So the, uh, like I said, there was no ransom money sent, uh, ransom uh, order sent in, and the Gallegos family was not a very wealthy family, so ransom and money was out of the question. 
due to the stalking of the child, it was very obvious that this was not a random abduction. And whoever took Sharon, they had been waiting for the perfect opportunity to take her. They had been following her, stalking her. This sounds like the case of Morgan Nick. Morgan Nick was stalked as well by this guy who was then uh, able to take her at this game. So there was an 11-year-old witness named Dolores who claimed to the police that she had actually seen that same vehicle parked right outside of Sharon's family home. And she stated that the driver of the vehicle was a heavy-set woman in her 30s. And she had been just staring intensely at the, at the um, Gallegos family home as if waiting for Sharon to come out of the house so she could have the opportunity to snatch her up like I said, is the most bizarre and weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. To this day, police officials and investigators are still trying to look for Sharon's abductors who may possibly be dead or in their 90s at this point. But they also want to know the reason behind Sharon's abduction, why she was targeted, why she was stalked, and why they took her if they wanted to raise a child and then ended up murdering her. What happened in between the days of her abduction and then her body being found? What happened? Where was she at? Who took her? At this point, nobody really knows. This is such a heartbreaking case. And oh my God, like this had me so upset and so stressed out. This poor girl was terrified for her life of these people. And they ended up taking her and killing her. It's just... It's so unfortunate. It's so awful. And I just feel like I wish I could have been there back then and could have helped out this family and just provided them safety, especially for their poor little child. I mean, imagine losing your, your child gets kidnapped. Then a couple of weeks later, they find out about this deceased body and you don't even know that it is your daughter for 62 years. Her parents might even be deceased at this point. I'm not sure if her siblings are still alive, but it's just, it's so heartbreaking and it's so stressful. Again, like I said, I'm so glad that her body was identified because now Sharon's family does have some closure as to where she went and what exactly happened to her. Though, like I said, we don't know the abductors or anything like that. I would love to know what you guys personally think about this case. And whether or not you think that the person or people that had taken Sharon had been stalking her, whether or not they could have been looking for a child. Because what I, what I personally think is that they had been looking for a child. They kidnapped Sharon to raise her as their own, dyed her hair so that she looked more like them. But something went wrong. Maybe she acted out. Maybe she was terrified, didn't want to be around them. This probably caused the couple to get lashed out at her and kill her. And then they quickly, you know, disposed of her body and moved on with their life. That's just my opinion. I would love to know what you guys think about this case and whether or not you believe that Sharon's abductors will be identified one day. I sure as hell hope so. And I would love to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Please like this video, share it with your friends, get this case out there. Let me know what you guys think about this case. It's frustrating. It's so frustrating because it just, it seems like it will never fully get closure. We'll never fully find out what happened to Sharon, why she was taken, who took her, and what led up to her death. But like I said, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you never miss any of my videos. And I'm going to go take a break now. But take a bit, a bit of a breather because I'm trying not to cry. Because this case it just broke my heart. And I would love to see you guys in my next video. So like I said, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Comment your thoughts down below. And I'll see you next time. Bye.